to begin this evening by introducing Robin Goldsmith, along with the Goldsmith family, who is here with us tonight, um, and have Robin tell you a little bit about the award that is the occasion for this lecture. Thank you, Donna. The award we give tonight, in Myron's memory, was actually begun by Myron. In the early 60s, when Myron returned to Chicago to join the office of Skidmore, Owens, and Merrill, he was started teaching in the graduate program, the thesis program, here at IIT. He was working full-time and was able to take only a few students each semester. The teaching was very important to him for two reasons, I believe. First, his own education here with Mies, Hilversheimer, David Hans, and Paul Hill changed his life, and he was grateful for that experience. And second, teaching allowed him to continue to study and research a particular interest of his, long span and high-rise structures. But if any of you are familiar with the early theses from the 60s through the 80s, you realize that they included a variety of structures, bridges, hangars, small buildings, and even a church. The students were, for the most part, mature, highly motivated, born-born, and worked full or part-time. But as graduation approached, their visas and their resources often ran out. And to complete their visas, they would simply ask a friend or a fellow student to photograph their models. Myron believed that good work deserved good photography, and there were very good photographers that Myron called upon to help. Aaron Siston, Richard Nickel, Henry Blessing, Orlando Banban, to name a few. Of course, the students never knew where the funds came from for the photography or other minor costs to finish their thesis. Myron simply said, there was a grant for that. When I paid the bills, I called it Myron's grant. It was not a lot of money, but it made a difference for a number of students for a number of years. At Myron's death, our son Mark and daughter Chandra, who is here tonight, and our extended family at IIT, then George Danforth, David Sharp, George Shipwright, Ed Lindhurst, and Bert Benson, we all decided that the best way to honor Myron's memory was to continue what he had begun. David Sharp, Myron's close friend and colleague, who became director of the thesis program, guided the majority of these awards through the years. This year's recipient is Michael Walker, who completed his graduate work with Professor Valtamaki. His thesis is a complex of three mid-sized buildings connected by a central atrium. It is the proposed building headquarters for the energy industry in the new city located in Qatar on the Arabian Peninsula. It seeks to address some of the questions and challenges that arise from a high-tech building in a low-tech environment. One of the unique aspects of this thesis is that it is, in fact, under construction and will be completed in 2012. The other unique and personal aspect is that Myron knew Michael and was pleased when Michael started his graduate work at IIT many years ago. Michael, I am sure Myron would be equally pleased that you would have returned to finish your graduate work with this timely thesis. Congratulations. Thank you, Robin and Michael. Uh, 
Um, next, I would like to um, have a brief commercial interview. Um, I would like to remind you of an upcoming date that is um, in connection with uh, the reason that we're here tonight to celebrate the legacy of work here at IIT. And that date is for a tribute to Professor David Sharp, who is retiring. And so we'd like to gather together to celebrate a lifelong dedication to IIT. We'll do that in the form of an open house reception on Saturday, May 8, 2010, from 2 to 5 p.m. upstairs in Crown Hall. So it's a, a come as you can kind of event. Um, people will filter in and out. And I hope it will be a wonderful uh, springtime afternoon that will give us a, an occasion to celebrate all the powerful contributions that David Sharp has made to our college bar culture. And now it's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, who is Edward Windhorst. Edward has his BA from Carleton College with a major in philosophy and German. He then went on to have a career that got interrupted by pursuit of architecture studies here at IIT. And um, he gained his Master of Architecture here, conducting not one but two thesis projects under Martin Goldsmith. After IIT for almost 10 years, he um, practiced with the Chicago firm of DiStefano and Partners, ending as a design partner. Since 2004, he's been a principal of Edward Windhorst, James Gorski Architects, LLC, with a staff of six. He is the author of many recent books. Uh, the Lake Point Tower, a design history book, co-authored with Kevin Harrington and published by Chicago Architectural Foundation in 2009. The upcoming Mies van der Rohe, a critical biography, second edition, co-authored with Franz Schultz, of about um, 750 pages, which is uh, forthcoming in August of 2011, published by the University of Chicago. Some of you were here for the lecture that Franz and Ed gave on that research that they've done. That was the other high point of our semester. Uh, and then he uh, is the sole author of the Goldsmith Sharp monograph that is accompanying this lecture. So if you haven't seen it already, please stop at the book table um, afterwards and get a look at um, another Edward's accomplishments documenting many who have been here for thesis with us and so many who have taught them. Thank you. Who was a faculty member here and a student of 
David's and Myron's. Uh, Donald Sickler, my dear friend and uh, senior member of the Mies office uh, in the 1950s, Don is here, worked on this very building that we're in, and he's very kind to come uh, tonight. Uh, my colleague, Todd Solat, structural engineer, who has helped with uh, analysis of some of the buildings in this uh, set of work. Um, John Vinci, who's here tonight, very close colleague of Myron's. Franz Schultz, my co-author. Chandra um, Goldsmith, of course, and Stephen Gray. Mrs. Goldsmith, uh, who I'm very thankful to um, continue to have a close relationship with. And uh, Ruth and Professor William Sharp. Um, and, and then uh, to the memory of my book. So let me start. Um, the, the task uh, that we all set for ourselves in in uh, commemorating or trying to commemorate David's career here was to uh, choose some of the best work that he and Myron had done together and separately, um, illustrate, them, illustrate that work uh, in a book that would survive for a while so that um, we had thought about doing a, an exhibition. I think there probably still will be some level of exhibition done in May. Uh, but we felt that this kind of tribute was appropriate to the magnitude and importance of Myron in David's careers. Um, when we uh, started to look at the thesis program uh, as a whole, I was actually quite surprised um, to see that of the uh, thesis is done at IIT since 1932, when the master's program was uh, started, actually before me, uh, David and Myron together uh, have actually been the advisors for the majority of those almost 500 pieces. It's an amazing thing. You can see here in this uh, chart, uh, I thought I'd start off something rather unsexy here. Um, the city regional planning program was as intense as a master's program, as the architecture program. It uh, peaks in the 60s and 70s and goes away then when the city and regional planning ended. And you can see, of course, at the very end, the um, rapid growth of the program, the master's program in the 90s and then in the 2000s. Here's a, another quick look at, um, statistically, at the thesis program. The dark columns are the numbers of theses that were directed by Myron and by David together and separately. Uh, one thing I will say for as we go through these projects, um, there's always, uh, traditionally, there's a main advisor to an IIT thesis project. There is usually a committee of three, um, often uh, on these thesis projects, with Myron is the, the main advisor, David will be the co-advisor or one of them. These roles are, to some degree, interchangeable. So I've simply labeled some of these as being Myron's work and some being David's, but basically up until about 1990, um, the theses that are shown in the book and also excerpted here were led by Myron and then by David after Myron's death. We'll talk a little bit about Myron's own thesis, which was finished in 1953. This is Myron, this is a diagram from Myron's own thesis. Um, those of you who know the origin of this diagram in Galileo will know that Myron is quoting, visually quoting Galileo here. Um, one could um, one thing about thesis is quite a remarkable work, 15 double-spaced typewritten pages, uh, a couple of diagrams, and that's about it. But what it did for Myron and for the thesis program at IIT was um, set up a uh, series of investigations that uh, have gone on, and I hope to demonstrate have gone on uh, almost until now. Uh, the question that Myron uh, posed to himself um, was uh, basically taking the scale problem that Galileo and others had identified in nature um, and translating that scale question and problem to buildings. Um, Myron knew, for example, that in the case of bridges, there were um, different structural systems were needed for different scales of construction. He speculated that that relationship would hold true in building. 
it in fact does hold true in the building. And much of the work of the next 50 years is a demonstration of that principle in uh, various ways in the study of particular buildings, whether they be long span buildings, high rise buildings, etc. This is, in addition to Myron's uh, speculating his, his sort of thought experiment, which was the main component of his thesis, um, he also produced building designs which were intended to illustrate the principle that he was uh, adumbrating, that principle being that in the case of tall buildings, as buildings got taller, their structural systems needed to change. They must change. He posited uh, that, I think as he said it, uh, structural systems have a minimum and maximum size. And uh, once a structure becomes uh, too large for a particular system, then that system must change. This is, for 1953, an immensely tall building, an 80-story concrete building, which uses a concrete super frame. The uh, individual levels of this building uh, are supported inside this enormous frame. And this is Myron's speculation about the future of tall buildings, or one of the possible futures for tall buildings. It turns out, as you'll see, that he was not only pessimistic but almost dead on a number of these uh, speculations. The next one, and I think the most important one, is a series of steel buildings that Myron imagined that would be diagonalized, that would have tubular structures. If you look closely at this image, you'll see the little people down at the bottom of the trees. So these are about 60 story buildings. And Myron believed that the future of high rise uh, architecture and engineering would probably include some kind of diagonalization of the structure that would allow buildings to become taller without becoming less efficient. Now, those of you who know the future uh, and have seen the past will know that his speculation was incredibly accurate. And this was uh, the first time that uh, an architect had put on paper designs of this sort. You'll see how this concept weaves itself through the thesis projects that come after it. One thing I should say for those of you that uh, aren't um, familiar with the thesis format and what the thesis was about. Um, as I said, IIT had a thesis program, a master's program, before MIS, but only four students completed it during the 1930s. It was an inauspicious time in 1932, started graduate school. Um, but when MIS and Hills uh, came to the college in the late 1930s, they basically established a set of criteria for uh, what a thesis should be. And in the period when Mies was director from 1938 to 1958, about 30 student projects were completed, master's degrees were completed. Usually, in Mies' era, these projects were uh, what Mies would call representational buildings, uh, uh, art museums, arenas. Uh, special buildings that students studied in detail uh, for which they produced a complete design. By complete, I mean uh, something that we would recognize as a uh, presentation quality uh, set of documents um, that then were woven into a book, had a narrative attached to them, drawings and models and etc. That was the thesis program under these. Myron's thesis was actually atypical that he didn't do an individual building. He did a lot of thinking about the way buildings might be. And that ended up being a very fruitful uh, venture. Um, I, I uh, want to show this picture only because it includes David Sharp and Phyllis um, Lambert, another famous graduate of the school, um, and two other students, uh, Ying Sin Chin, uh, on the far left, and Jin Kim, who went on to a long career at SOM on the far right. <coughs> this is Myron in 1962 with his first group of students, uh, which included David and Phyllis. Um, unfortunately, this is David's thesis, not very uh, visual, but uh, I can explain it a little bit. Um, 
David was, um, David and, and Phyllis together, were assigned the task by my of making an empirical study of built buildings um, to identify the spans that specific building systems efficiently cover. Uh, this is a composite chart of David's research, which shows uh, particular building systems and their effective span ranges uh, based on, as a function of the uh, weight of these structures. And what was important about this thesis um, was that it confirmed Myron's speculations that structural systems had minimum, maximum, and optimal sizes. David did this for steel structures, and Lambert did it for concrete structures. This work also, as you'll see, I hope I can demonstrate, uh, continues to be, continues to enrich the thesis program as we move forward. Uh, one unique thing about David's career is not only is David's career closely tied to Myron's, but um, David, immediately upon uh, finishing his thesis, came to the school, began to teach, and also began to be a thesis advisor with Myron. So that uh, closely interchangeable very early in David's career, which is one reason why um, I like to characterize, and I did in the book, this as one amazing career of 50 years duration. I picked uh, for this talk about 20 projects. Um, in the book, we have 45 thesis projects that out of the 280 that uh, Myron and David supervised. Um, it was quite a battle to get it down to 45. There were many, many um, excellent projects that we did not include for, for various reasons, some being very technical. Uh, we also wanted to show, both in the book and here tonight, some thesis projects that have not been widely published. Some of the early projects that Myron did in the 1960s have been widely published, uh, and some of the architects who did those have become very well known. Uh, Peter Pran would be an example. Uh, and we did not use Peter's uh, project in the book or here tonight. It's just that we had uh, a desire to show other work. Um, this is a project by Mayuji Watanabe. It was done in 1960. Three, the first one of the first projects that Myron did. Those of you that know the uh, Mises 50 by 50 house will recognize this as a supersized version of that smaller project. Uh, this is the first of many long span studies that Myron undertook, but in specific buildings for specific solutions. One of the uh, one of the things I think about the thesis program is that uh, students are assign or develop or assign and develop themselves um, real projects with real programs, real sites, budgets, uh, real structural problems and analysis, etc. So as to, as closely as possible, uh, simulate the experience of really designing and building a building, uh, or designing a building that can be built better. Um, Watanabe's thesis is a, Watanabe's program is a trained exhibition hall that is intended to be added to the Museum of Science and Industry. And uh, in the book, we have some other beautiful um, site models that Guadagnani did to show how this building uh, was integrated with the Beaux-Arts plan of the uh, Museum of Science and Industry. An elevation view of that same building. Myron later uh, used this concept uh, for a submittal, an SOM submittal to the 1964 World's Fair in New York, which was not accepted, but um, a further enhancement of this uh, project, which was also done uh, with the steel industry cooperation. Uh, at this time, uh, high strength steels were becoming available. Uh, Myron was very interested in their potential. Um, but as always, the aesthetic success of the project was the, the main goal. The next project is um, Mikio Sasaki's 1964 thesis. Um, I characterize this in the book next to Myron's as the most important thesis to come out of IIT. I'd be happy to defend that one. Um, this project became the John Hancock Building. Um, 
on this project and on a couple of earlier ones, uh, Myron had asked Fazla Khan to assist. Um, um, I do discuss in the book, in my little essay, how that came about. Um, Khan was uh, 32 years old at the time he came to work with Myron at the beginning at IIT. He was on the cusp of a hugely uh, successful career, cut short by his early death in the age of 52, 1982. But in that 20-year uh, period, um, Faz and Myron together at IIT with David um, were able to explore a number of uh, systems, structural systems, which uh, then became uh, various buildings within the SOM uh, world. Um, the idea here, the problem here, uh, Sasaki, of course a Japanese student, was interested in doing a tall building for Tokyo in a high-risk um, earthquake zone. And the problem was studied and it became evident immediately that um, wind forces, lateral forces from wind and not earthquake, would be the controlling factors. Myron had his idea of diagonalizing tall buildings in steel that was, as he said, he dusted it off, it was 10 years old at the time. He asked Sasaki to study it, and this was the building that resulted. Um, the Hancock building, uh, the timing of the Hancock building was such that this uh, problem was well understood by Khan uh, when that project became a 100 story project. And there's a long, interesting story of how that happened. Uh, Myron did not work on the Hancock building, but he was the uh, intellectual father of it. Uh, Another thesis from the 60s, another long-standing thesis, which has not been published, uh, not, been, uh, not really received, I think, any attention uh, in the scholarly world, is a thesis by uh, uh, Sattler, uh, Christoph Johannes Sattler, a German. Uh, Sattler got interested in um, the program that was then published, this was in 1962, for the Boston City Hall, which you may, uh, many of you I'm sure will know the brutalist building that came out of the competition for that building. Sattler took that program, the program for a major uh, urban city hall, and created this building. Uh, what's of interest is the uh, sort of mixing of uh, Miesian symbolism, uh, the Miesian understanding of space, uh, for this symbolic purpose of an open democratic city hall. Uh, Sattler decided with, uh, with Fosler uh, and Myron uh, to develop a Viringil system, and I'll peek ahead here and show you what that system is. This is the building module, 140 feet on the side, in which the upper three floors are the Viringil truss system, which allows the bottom floor to be a clear span at the ground. So the idea here, very decent idea of openness and transparency applied to a, uh, a symbol of democratic government. Very good for detail building, very similar details uh, emerge in later buildings that Myron worked on, particularly the Inland Steel Research Center, if you know that, that building. In 1967, uh, Paul Zor did a thesis with Myron and Fadas and David, which was nominally uh, an attempt to develop a warehouse for the storage of shipborne freight. Uh, but in the process of developing this thesis, um, Zor discovered, and Myron and Faz and David endorsed, um, the discovery that this building was beautiful enough, uh, poetic enough in its structure that it could serve other higher purposes in the Mason hierarchy, such as uh, possibly an art museum or, or special governmental building. Um, if you look in the book here, you'll see we also took advantage of the additional space to print Zor's beautiful site models. Um, this was one of six buildings that Zor was proposing for um, the harbor site at, uh, on, the, on the southwest side, of, southeast side of Chicago. Um, it's, uh, it's valuable at this point just to mention a little bit about the photography. It's interesting that uh, Robin mentioned it also in talking about Mike and Walker's project. Um, Myron understood, and I think he understood this from his time at Nice, that uh, models were a key 
method of communicating about architecture that they, if they were photographed properly, they would end up being the permanent um, embodiment of these projects when they did not get built. Um, and he was very concerned that these projects have excellent photography. Um, this, these photographs were done by Joseph Jockner, who was a student of the IB, uh, I think a faculty member of the IB at the time, and then went on to teach photography at Circle Campus for almost 30 years. They're so beautiful. And um, they're uh, particularly beautiful in the pre Photoshop era when it's really hard to make good photographs. Another thesis from the 60s, and I have several here from the 60s, and um, you'll see that the uh, time distribution of these projects is uh, crowded toward the 60s and then later toward the 90s uh, with David. But um, this is a thesis by Larry Kenny, who. Um, no. No, I'm sorry. <laughs> it's hard for me to read my notes here. Um, it's by Hutchinson, Robin Hutchinson. Uh, which is uh, the first examination in concrete of the diagonalization concept that Myron developed in steel, both in his thesis and in Sasaki's thesis. Um, these are uh, the building that's at the lower right in this image is the Prudential building, so you can see the scale of these structures. Um, they're very large buildings. The intention here was to demonstrate the feasibility of the system. Uh, this was done with uh, calculations and models by Khan and others. Um, the system infills the opening between the sort of traditional opening that uses a window between the spandrels and the columns. Um, on a large diagonal, infills those spaces to create um, very large X's, as you can see, across the tower. The this system was later used at Ontario Center at 708 Third Avenue in New York. Um, as a concrete infill structural system with very little penalty for height. All right, this is long span, right? Um, this is a uh, another long span project from the 60s, from the late 60s. Um, it's interesting on a number of levels. Uh, a fascinating project, which also resulted in a building at Baxter Travenal and Deerfield that was done in the early 70s, which Larry Kenny actually uh, was hired by SLM to work on. So a very direct transfer of student life into professional life on this very project. Um, this project is interesting, though, also because it, is, it comes at the time uh, when the role of the railroad in Chicago was diminishing and almost disappearing. This was an attempt to consolidate, the program was to consolidate um, rail terminal in Chicago, which would have a modern expression. As you can see, the roof is suspended and also held down by an array of state cables. Um, another very beautiful model and beautiful photography uh, commits only the minor sin of using uh, contemporary automobiles, which somewhat dated, as you can see, the Bob Saka in 1968 was not successful. That's the end of the 60s, and if you uh, look in the book, there's another six or seven other theses. Um, it's a very active period for Martin and for David in school. The 70s is somewhat less active. We only chose three projects from the 70s, but I think they're indicative of new trends that Myron and David were exploring. This is a project from 1974 by uh, by Hayashida, another Japanese student, also done for Tokyo. Um, this, this exactly coincides with the completion of Sears Tower, and it is a similar concept, a bubble tube of 88 stories, uh, an office building, a hotel. I'll skip ahead to the plan. You can see much more clearly the bubble tube array, the 60 foot wide uh, structural bay. Um, what I think is, uh, and this is the first important mixed-use building that is studied by Myron and David. Uh, as we'll see as we move on here, the mixed-use building is David's primary interest in the period after 1990. Uh, and he takes the use design to a very high level. I think a level that 
Um, my own couldn't have anticipated, but I think it would be um, approving of. Another beautiful model, uh, beautiful photography here. The building looks like a real building. And there are several more uh, very beautiful images in the book. Those of you who know Myron's career know that he was first and foremost a lover and designer of bridges. He was um, interested in bridge design from very early, both as a scale problem, that is, how do you change the design of a bridge for short medium milestone, etc., but also for the aesthetic potential of it. Uh, long before Santiago Calatrava and other designers became known as uh, aestheticians, if you will, of bridge design, Myron was deeply involved in that. In the late 1970s, he designed with T.Y. Lin the uh, bridge for the American River in California called the Rocketrucky Bridge, which was not built. Some people consider it the most important unbuilt bridge of the 20th century, and I would be among them. Uh, a 1,300-foot span, uh, it State bridge of curving plan in which the tables were anchored in the steep sides of the ravine. Myron adapted that concept for this uh, bridge by Meta in 1982, in which he attempted to study the problem at a flat site that would require a curving roadway. And as you can see, the results are very quiet. Startling, a little bit startling, is the simplicity of the plan of this building, of this bridge. Uh, as you can see, very rational plan and very rational solution. One of the wonderful things about the Rakachaki solution was that it was both very beautiful and the most economical solution for that project that was offered in the state of California. Uh, beauty is important, efficiency, economy is also equally important for my own today. 1986, the thesis of K. Veer. This had been widely published, and we decided to publish it again for a number of reasons. Um, it's the first super tall building that Myron and David worked on. I believe that's right, David. Um, 142 stories. It's the site is worth points, just next to the merchandise mart, a site that is very heavily studied by IIT students over the last 60 or 70 years. An excellent site for a super tall building. Um, what I found uh, Interesting in thinking about this and including this in the book is that in fact now we have a building that's even more, even taller than this building. Um, so that a building that seemed 25 years ago to be at the extreme of, of probability and, and constructability um, is really now just one of the crowd. The idea here, I think I'll move to the next slide to show you the detail. Um, that arises now in almost all of the tall mixed use buildings that Myron and David will study. How do you reduce the floor plate uh, of a tall building as it rises and as the, the needs for deep space or deep lease stands are reduced? And you have uh, office spaces, uh, at least in this period, you could have 40 or 50,000 square foot floors, but as you go up, you're looking for 20, even 15, sometimes even less. So how do you do that? How do you do that in a structural system that is efficient and that transfers those lighter loads? Um, this idea was to rotate uh, the tower, and as that rotation happened, to reduce floor areas by inscribing squares inside other squares, and then taking the forces at the midpoints of these setbacks and transferring them with cape racing uh, down to the four corners of the tower. You can see that in both at the uh, magnum scale here and um, this was not invented, I think, by Myron and David, but brought to its first um, satisfactory aesthetic uh, completion with this building. Um, here it was uh, uh, very, very interested in the way her project represented, uh, the continuity of her project with past um, tradition in Chicago design and um, structural engineering. I think it was a very successful project for its time. I think as you see, um, as we move further on and get closer to the present, um, you'll see in David's work 
uh, both of these themes, but also a, a much deeper uh, engagement with the quality of the exterior wall. Um, this building, uh, 25 years in the past, has a little bit uh, of a cartoonish, and I don't mean that negatively, I just mean it as a neutral description, uh, exterior wall. It's there, but I think you'll see in some of these uh, projects coming up, much more realism and, and attention to uh, human scale in uh, the exterior walls of all buildings. Um, this is a project from 1990 by Gerhard Winkens, and um, the, uh, the scholarship here lists uh, Bill Baker as the primary structural advisor on this project. I hope that's true, Bill. Um, this is a, also a project that has not been widely published but it, it is a precursor to buildings that have, more recent buildings that have been achieved uh, in a number of interesting ways. One of the things that Rankins is trying to do here, I think I'll show the other view so you can see it, you can see some trees up there in the atrium spaces. Um, Rankins was trying to do a multi-use hall building uh, essentially without setbacks, um, taking advantage of the full prismatic form that was available to him. Uh, but doing the reduced floor areas by carving out spaces within the prismatic bottom of the tower. Um, David told me that Joe uh, Bujikawa was one of the uh, advisors on this project and was very um, demanding about the economic consequences of this kind of carving out. Um, but I think it's really not about the economics, it's about the idea of another approach to um, tower setbacks in which the space that's captured can be used for other uh, positive goods. In this case, the middle of the building is residential, the top is hotel, and these atria are colonized, if you will, uh, by guess what, green spaces. And we've seen that repeatedly in the last 10 or so years, probably started um, most, uh, most um, famously by Norman Foster's building in the front room. In 1990, uh, David's, piece, uh, David's student, uh, Mohan Srinivasan, undertook a study of the, what was the Comiskey Park problem, uh, how do we replace Comiskey Park. Um, and part of that study, and it's very much in the tradition of David and Phyllis Lambert's work, was, a, was an exhaustive analysis of existing baseball and football stadium Stadia, sorry. Um, posing the question, can you do both things in one building? And this problem has been studied back and forth in pro and con for decades. But Srinivasan came to the conclusion, I think it's the right conclusion, that you need separate facilities for baseball and football, and in this case, soccer as well. And so Srinivasan proposed this a dual stadium with shared infrastructure, shared parking, and a shared uh, high bar roof. Um, very interesting in terms of timing here, this project came along right before uh, Camden Yards in Baltimore, right before the retro love affair that baseball has had for the last 10 or 15 or 20 years. Particularly his treatment of the roof, this roof slides uh, on two tracks, doesn't fan, it doesn't fold. A very straightforward look, um, again with economy and efficiency. One of David's um, favorite projects, as he's told me a number of times. In 1992, King Tzu, X-U, is Tzu's last name, um, did a project, uh, this is also with uh, Bill Baker and the Jude Mary, and I apologize to Maju for not mentioning him earlier. Um, Maju came to school in 1982 and joined the faculty and became a um, very important advisor to Myron and to the thesis program as well as teaching other courses and structures. Um, and I believe so far, um, I'm sorry, Maju was also the structural advisor on Kager's thesis. I apologize for that. Um, this project is another mixed-use building, but a very different take on a mixed-use problem. It's a little hard to explain in a brief time, but basically, um, 
the two sides of the building, uh, the, the pieces that are on the ends, if you will, um, are ultimately a hotel on one side and residential on the other. The office function is in the middle and also at the top. The advantages here were that the ancillary hotel and residential could share the vertical circulation with the hotel, with the office space, and that the office space um, could, could enjoy particularly large floors and good views at the upper levels because the core is not away. Um, this, to study this building, this is a little bit uncharacteristic in the pieces program, in both steel and concrete. There's a concrete version, as you can see here, sorry, and the steel version. You can take the pick. Both of them are, I think, very beautifully resolved. Um, right to the uh, right there, the little triangular building is the, um, the hotel that's on, that's on uh, Wacker Drive. And it's escaping me. But that site is for you on the south bank of the river. Now, the rest of the projects that I'm going to show are Davis projects. Um, at this, this project is completed in 1995. This is Daehong Min, um, who does a essentially a Sears Tower program for Seoul, Korea. Um, we show this for a number of reasons. Not only uh, we think it's a beautifully resolved building, um, these are in fact drawings. And we're now in the era, in the early 1990s, where the computer has become a factor in architectural production for students as well as for professionals. Um, Drawings like this were not within the, the range of a single student doing a thesis project before the computer came along. So that's one of the reasons we showed them here. Here's the model. I'll go back to the drawing in just a moment to show you that um, in this case, um, a, another and some approach to reducing floor area um, as David and Dehan have, are rotating the plan and taking little slices out of it, etc. Um, but one thing I like about this, one, thing I, one reason I included this and included it here tonight, I don't think it's the strongest thesis visually, but an incredibly handsome building taking a traditional 4 million square foot program, a huge program, uh, buildings that are not being done right now as office buildings, but are being done as residential buildings. And um, showing in a complete project what a student can do um, with a very experienced faculty member in a very, very difficult problem. Uh, I think most of the buildings that I'm showing you tonight are good or better than equally large buildings that have actually been produced by the profession. Now, one can argue that students and thesis writers are subject to some of the constraints that real buildings are, but all the better. Um, these are very accomplished works, and in most cases, um, could be built based on a schematic design that would come out of this project. A quick interlude here um, to a project which is not a thesis project, but, if you will, a super thesis project, a faculty project that was done in 1997 for the Hyundai Corporation, in which IIT was retained for... Seen here is a site model of the entire development, which includes this world's tallest building, about 150 stories at the time. Um, a large number of ancillary buildings which were not done in detail by the IIT team. A multi-level uh, transportation and infrastructure base. Um, in short, very much uh, in focus today, how does one do very dense urban develop new urban development on ineffective greenfield sites for Asian countries? And Professor Shipwright and others have been in the forefront of that investigation at IIT. Uh, George was deeply involved in this project, as well as David Sharp, um, Ju, uh, Bob Krejcik, and uh, Myron before his death. Um, 
One other reason to show this, of course, is that it shows how the faculty does the same thing in assigned students, which is try to figure out how to do super tall building, make it look good, make it work economically, build a structure that is buildable and, um, and, and feasible. In this case, a special case for IIT, um, that Hyundai was a real client, and uh, they expected a real building with real solutions. For that reason, the faculty team did uh, four schemes. And I'll just show you quickly the alternate schemes. This is a super column scheme that was very much in vogue. Super column towers were, were very much in the 1990s um, and still are. Um, a scheme that is based on uh, Myron called as a buttress uh, diagonalized frame scheme. Which is based closely on a thesis by Lin, which was finished in 1991. Myron very much likely not using the book, partly because it was so well publicized. And then a uh, steel diagonally braced tower, somewhat asymmetrical form, as a third alternate. These three alternates were rejected by the client in favor of this scheme, which was accepted. And um, this is basically a scheme that David developed um, as his assignment. The, Three previous schemes were divided among other faculty. Um, as you can see here, oops, sorry, this last view I have of that. Um, there are a number of innovations here which are taken to um, high level of development, higher than I think you would see in a normal piece of project. These setback areas where the where the tower cascades at the corners are designed as areas of refuge. Um, there are three of these in the tower. A steel structure with a post space uh, steel cage, 150 stories if I remember correctly, David. Um, and uh, again, the rotated square theme as the tower is rising, the square footprint at the base rotates 45 degrees through these four areas. Um, as David explained to me, uh, this project was presented to the uh, Hyundai Corporation on the very week of the 1997 Asian financial crisis and any future chance for this project to go forward um, evaporated almost instantly. This is a project from around 2000 and, and here um, I introduce another character in the play of characters, Ahmad Abdel Razak, who was um, a structural engineer at this time at Skid Lawrence and Merrill, who uh, in the in the late 19 uh, mid 1980s, I believe, became interested in uh, working at the school. Uh, partly, I think, out of um, when I talked to him, I talked to him a couple of weeks ago from his uh, office in Korea now, where he works for the Samsung Corporation. Um, Ahmad was looking for a chance to spread his wings and study more conceptually um, building design um, than he had an opportunity to do at that time uh, with an SLM. A number of these projects, I think the next four or five, are projects in which Abdel Razak was the structural advisor. Sometimes he advised with Majub, sometimes um, alone. Uh, but I think you'll see that these next few projects, of course, have the benefit of time marching on and um, more experience both from David and from the potential for uh, alternates to the high-rise uh, mixed-use buildings. Um, I think you'll see that these projects are uh, imaginative, uh, more creative, in, in a way, more exploring than some of the earlier ones. Um, this is a Block 37 project, about four million square feet of uh, program space, in which the tower is not particularly slender, but it has a hole down the middle of it. You can see it here. Uh, and these five sections that go up the tower, um, each having a different programmatic use, are U-shaped so that there is a, an enclosed, sorry, non enclosed atrium in each of them. Uh, a super frame scheme, very similar to Hayes Bank of China, visually. Um, it is interesting uh, to look at these projects in the context of what's going on in the profession. Of course, it's inevitable that students uh, see and are influenced by their work. Um, but it's usually pretty easy to date certain projects by correspondence to works being built at the time. 
But I would say in this case, this is a much more imaginative scheme, uh, much more expensive than probably two than phase schemes of the Bank of China. Uh, one of my personal favorite projects is um, the next one. Uh, this is by Sang Hong Moon with Abdel Razak as structural advisor. It's a very simple scheme visually uh, in which uh, there's an octagonal plan at the base, an octagonal plan at the top. The alternating big flat sides do not taper in the corners do. And most beautifully, I think, the diagonalization of the structure is taken around the corners in a very effective and uh, aesthetically powerful way. Uh, skiing to the uh, SOM tower that's going up now in New York on the World Trade Center site. Rotated square, which uh, square, the base square rotates to 45 degrees to the top. Um, it's a very simple scheme uh, visually, but an example of the very powerful simplicity that Myron and David have always been interested in. Very legible scheme. Uh, works very well in terms of reducing floor plate and also works well as a structure which, as we say, confuses the wind because of its chain and profile as it rises. It's one of the issues that Abdel Razak was very much interested in along with other professionals um, as buildings got taller and taller in the 90s. The thesis project that uh, we chose for the cover of the book is by um, Kun Suk Shin from 1999, also a project that David did with Ahmad Abdel Razak. David at this point and Ahmad I think as well are looking at other geometries to resolve the mixed-use tall building problem that is a reduced floor place um, as these buildings get taller. This is a very tall building, 1800 feet uh, for a site in the uh, Illinois Center. Just South of the river again, another site that David studied very intensely. The plan of this building, and the best way to understand it is to see a plan in which you see that the square base uh, rises to a rectangle which is inscribed in that base, and the rectangle meets the square at the third points of that square. The effect is, I'll go back to the other image now, is that there are four points at which the exterior wall is plumb, vertical, four vertices, and the rest of the, uh, the rest of the wall is hyperbolically shaped. Here's the other view, this is the view used on the cover, diagonally braced uh, tube structure, um, but a very powerful, simple shape that I think is representative of the kinds of buildings that David and Myron were always trying to do very open form. The elegant speaks for itself in a way. As we get into the 2000s, uh, this is also under the uh, influence of Abdel Razak. Um, this is a student, Jim Lee, who became interested with David and Ahmad. Super tall buildings. This is a 3,000 foot tall building. Uh, which uses a super frame system, uh, which I think I can best demonstrate by a series of plans here. As you can see, for example, on the upper left, um, there is a square in each corner of the big square, which is in this case about a 90 feet square, which is an independent diagonalized structure, which creates a super frame that allows um, this structure to be twice the height of a regular super tall building. Um, you can see another factor here, another thing that's actually quite amazing about this thesis, and again the computer is uh, the co-conspirator in this, is that uh, this student worked out hundreds of floor plans. This building has 249 floors, and each of them, believe it or not, was very carefully worked out programmatically as a demonstration that this was a practical building solution. When I talked to Abel Razdek about this, uh, about his work with David in the last couple of weeks, he cited this prop, this project was one of his favorites, partly because he feels that the future of very tall buildings is with these superhuman structures. 
here are just uh, here are two of the elevations. You can see this building has holes in it, of course, which are there to again confuse the wind. Um, but these two drawings alone, and we have them in the book, and we can hardly do justice to them graphically. Um, this would have been a whole thesis in the 1960s. These two drawings. Um, so you can see the, uh, the power of, of the technologies that are available to us. In 2005, David did a, David uh, completed a thesis with Mr. S. M. Park, another Korean student for a PhD degree, uh, in which Park developed an algorithm for the conceptual design of super tall buildings uh, based on the potential to alter their shape from the bottom to the top. Um, this is, uh, we give this a couple of pages in the book and it uh, needs, needs even more explanation, but the simple way to describe this is that it's a program, a computer program, in which certain data is entered about building area, about the desirable footprint, the mix of uses, etc. And then various tests are made by the computer to develop uh, buildings that um, can taper, can twist, and reduce an area, again based on the factors that are provided to the program. So the, uh, the solutions, I would just for example, one, one example would be a building that was pentagonal at the base and square at the top, and how, how to get from point A to point B uh, without having uh, contorted surfaces on the walls, for example. So a very uh, extensive uh, study. I give that as background for the last couple of theses here because after Park's thesis was completed, his PhD thesis was completed, and this algorithm existed, David employed the algorithm with students who did then did traditional thesis projects, this being one of them. Um, this is Chung Woon Yoon. Um, this is another Block 37 project in which the building does a full twist. Um, this is very beautifully worked out, um, again with many, many dozens of plans. The other key point here is that these buildings are worked out in such a way that the exterior wall does not torque, that it's always in plane, as you can see from the joints here. Uh, and these buildings end up with very distinctive and sometimes interesting forms. Um, I think it's also remarkable that David, forgive me if I take a moment out more personal, I think David in his um, advanced years has shown a tremendous flexibility in exploring new potential for the things he's interested in with our super buildings. And um, the fact that he embraced uh, Park's thesis and that he's used it to generate um, other important significant buildings is a credit to his flexibility and his, uh, and his educational maturity. Oh, did I say that? Uh, the last thesis uh, is by uh, Dong Wu Li. This was completed in 2008. Um, most interesting, I think, because it represents uh, David's take and the students' take uh, on a more constructible and reasonable uh, version of Santiago Calatrava's Chicago Spire. Uh, those of you who remember that um, twisting structure, um, this, this attempts to do the same thing with very simple means. Uh, actually, all that happens here is that the slab edges vary relative to the columns so that these uh, triangular, these diagrid patterns can be established on the exterior wall at very little expense and create um, a quite a dynamic and imposing structure on the skyline. The student was also able to imagine it as part of the skyline in which time, thanks to computer aided means. Um, but again, another example of David's interest in uh, exploring uh, innovative ideas, but doing it in a way that is constructible and affordable. I'll end with a couple of images of our 
topic for tonight. This was dated in 1960, making trees in Mises' office. <laughs> and uh, I think we can see many of the characteristics of our hero of the evening right here. Attention to detail, commitment, uh, understanding that architecture is not a one-man band, but part of a much larger arena of work. David was kind enough to pose for us for this portrait a couple of weeks ago. And I uh, leave you with uh, three, three wishes. Um, one is that when we're David's age, we're as proud of what we've done, justified as proud of what we've done, done as David is here. Secondly, that at the age of 81, we look this good. <laughs> and um, that regardless of our age, we be as good. Sometimes that was every other day, sometimes it was months at a time. 
uh, the better the student, the more productive the student, the more it got done, and the better the decisions were. So in that way, I think that it mirrored, the, it mirrored a large office. And what, what doesn't mirror the large office is that a single student isn't working collaboratively in a team as he would in an office, he or she would in an office, and doesn't have the resources to make the progress between meetings that you would in an office. Uh, but it's remarkably like a real office, at least my experience with a real office. And um, I think that's also reflected in the product. You know, the, these theses once in a while would be done in a year, but more typically in two and sometimes more. Might be even more. But um, but the you know the same constraints are there, the constraints of resources, time, energy. Are we going to study this more, or are we going to make a decision to go ahead with it? When you read the texts, which I had the great pleasure of reading a lot of texts, and I quote them in the book because some of the some of the language is really wonderful, and it also captures the time in which it emerged. But when you read the text, you realize that um, the thesis can sometimes get away from the original set of concepts, which is, as we know, the way the world is as well. So some of the thesis text is, doesn't always sync with what's there. So there are imperfections, which uh, are typical of the world of architectural work as well. That mirrors the challenge. Um, still, I think ultimately, and of course we picked the cream of the crop here, I think, uh, not that there aren't other good projects, but um, over 50 years, we looked at 50 good projects. And um, it's a tremendous achievement for, uh, for a student, not an architect, someone with generally no experience in the office, to be brought along and, and to, be, uh, to be able to create 